You know, I, uh, we've been graced with students. Um, we were graced at the very beginning with our own very Ferguson Florida School District Band adults in the New York Outstanding. Doug, your last song, what was your last song you played? Don't Stop Believing. Don't Stop Believing. And so it's on that note, I, want to, I do want to be personal with you for a second. You know, who am I? Uh, first of all, we are all here because this is what I believe every family should do. This is what I believe every classroom should do. You should have classroom meetings. You get to know who the person is, what we're about, celebrate, and then get into work. Because people don't care about what you know until they know that you care. That you care about them, that you care about what they left behind, where they're coming, and where they're going, who they are, where they're going, what they need to get there. So that's why we're really here. Because I care about you, I want you to know about me, I want me to know about you, and I want us to be a family. I had the pleasure of going to the State Department to talk um, actually with them and two of our administrators in here to present some of the work we were doing. Um, we got to present some stuff about how we had you know, double digit gains at the high school level on EOCs and how we had over 70 college courses taken from students that were coursed out verbally. That's equivalent to $70,000 over the world. So we got to And while I was there, you know, it was really one of those beat you up kind of things. They were there to tell us, you know, what, really to see what we were doing and to tell us something that we may not have wanted to hear. But can I share with them how we're family first and foremost? And one of the state board members had the nerve to say, you know, that, that sounds nice, but don't be a family, be a team, because you know, you don't have to, you don't have to love a team. You just can tell it what to do, you can, you can push it where you want it to go. And, and I said, you know what? You know, we have a reputation. I said, that's maybe that's maybe more like Hazelwood was. And I said that right in front of Crystal Castro. I said, that's I said, no, I said, Ferguson Flossum is known for being a Ferguson Flossum family to the point that, uh, to, the, uh, to the point that when Hazelwood people go out and they do pretend to have some fun, they then say, oh, we're not Hazelwood, we're Ferguson Flossum. Because they know we don't mind. We don't mind going out and having fun and then coming back and do our work. So, Bottom line is, we are a family. We need to push back to anything that says we're not. And there are lots of things. There are so many systems. This is how I approach who I am. There are so many systems. There are systems of racism. And in this district, we have Hoffa. For those that are new here to this district, when we did our orientation to about 60 new people. I told them Hoffa is cold for for having racial conversations, seeing how race impacts high achievement. The thing I need to do as a superintendent is make that talk into action so that we have action items that's occurring so that we get done with the talk and do something for kids like $70,000 in the plan for kids to do things. Another thing we've done was last year even we had over, we had 200 kids who flew a plane. They didn't just ride a plane. They went to class on Saturdays because we did Saturday schools and we didn't make it Saturday school remediation. We made it Saturday school gifted classes. They studied how to write, read, talk, walk, go to the science center, simulations in a plane, and they literally had mentors who were retired army people and veterans, and over the course of two years, 200 people, 200 kids, middle school through high school, actually flew a four-person plane. Then I had the fun to take about five of them to Rockville, where I was previously the central office minister, do the kickoff for Crespi Elementary of middle school, and have five to flew a plane, and said, all right, to this whole school, 600, 700 kids, how many of you guys have flown a plane? Do you believe you can do it? Three kids rolled in, I can flown a plane. Said, all right, how'd you fly a plane? Well, my dad has a jet, you know, at Spirit St. Louis. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> next. <laughs> all right, cool. Next word, how did you fly a plane? Well, my mom's a flight attendant, you know, the pilot. I got to sit in the cockpit, it was on autopilot, but I kind of, you know, pretend to fly, and it was really cool. All right, that's great. And uh, last word, how did you do it? Well, I, I really didn't fly a plane, but I really like it on the Xbox. All right, you're the joke school. <laughs> And I said, well, look, you know, you guys are all Caucasians, and you know, you have some experience in flying. But these four blacks and one Caucasian here, they flew actually a real plane, and there are 200 more that look just like them. And that's what you call equity in education. Something that even the richest person in that school at Crestview who has a dad who owns a jet, really, was the only one that had that experience out of the whole group in that school at Crestview, which is right there off of Clarkson and Clayton. If you know where I'm talking about, that talks about they're so great. 
And I tell them, you know, when I was there, speaking truth to power, you're not great because of what you do, you're great because of how, who you do it with. You know, your greatness in test scores is not because of how you teach, but it's because of who you teach. If you didn't teach them, they would still get probably the same score that they earn. The difference here and there is that we have students that are just as bright, just as brilliant, but they don't come to school knowing 20,000 words. They come maybe knowing 5,000 if they're lucky, or maybe even 500 words if, if Ruby Payne's research is right. So we have to do twice as much to get them just as far to show them that it's important that you try and that you believe and that you can achieve. I can list tons of other things. I'm going to mention and send a shout out to Holman Elementary School, who is a black populated school, 100% white, poor area, and they made AYP flat out. I can go through the list. Also, Cross Keys was one that met nine, eight out of nine of that subgroups and the additional indicator being nine out of nine for eight out of ten. Nine hundred kids. Eight percent African American. That school did an IEP for everybody. The general ed teachers did an IEP for the regular ed kids and the special ed teachers did an IEP for the special ed kids. And bottom line is they weren't special ed or regular ed, they were just ed. Dick, Tom, Harry, Joseph, Stephen, and, and Lulu on the side, you know? And they made it happen for all of them because of what we all really do. Because we've all had those spots of shining moments. This district has had many districts that are buildings that is touted most frequently. We have a lot of names that we hear over and over again. But I want to top those that we don't hear so often. We also had achievement at both elementary schools. So many things. We had, we had other schools that were just outstanding, even, I mean, to the point that uh, they, the, the, the teams had the highest achievement within the district when you look at the specific achievement ratings. I know that we had a team at Ferguson Middle School that did that, as well as we had high school, McClure Dark, who made really eight out of 11 AYP standards high school. We're talking almost 2,000 kids who come with all kinds of issues every day and they are making these standards of AYP. AYP meaning, you know, 70% proficient, uh, 72 to be exact, that's high. That's very high. And if this year is 85, that's really high. Or that means you've got 10% growth overall, uh, which is just double digit growth, which is like, you know, if you're in basketball, you know, double digit, you know, in the rebounds and so on and so forth. That means you're an MVP, very important person. We have award-winning championship teams in this room from those schools. Lastly, was the basketball team from the Puma Uh, I remember being a little bit, a little bit older. They would talk. Uh, 
uh, when literally her last two fell out, and I was about five, uh, because I still sucked the life out of her, she never recovered from that. And I, and I was a you know, five-year-old, like the Kim Barger saw, and I, I looked at her and I said, I looked at her face and saw no teeth and all this wires in her mouth and blood. And I said, Mama, don't worry, Mama. Don't cry. Don't be sad. They'll grow back. <laughs> Next thing I knew, she had all these false teeth in her head. Come back. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, she told me that story, reminded me of that. Um, and uh, but nonetheless, and so that was my beginnings. My dad. I, I was fortunate enough to have a two-family home, two-parent home, uh, with my mom and my dad in the house. However, my dad was a high school dropout. He uh, he attended school in the city of St. Louis, uh, Rashad, and dropped out of tenth grade. Uh, he, he was a gang member, and because of the street that I grew up on, I was supposed to be a second generation gang member uh, to the Bloods, you know, on 20th Street, and he was one of that area. And he, of course, is, uh, he went to penitentiary because gang members do things illegal, uh, and he did things illegal and went to jail, learned a lot, uh, taught me a lot about how to be a man there, but nonetheless, uh, that's not something that most people are proud of, but it's who I am, and so I share truth with people. You have to know who I am in order to know why I do what I do. And so my dad also is a right leg amputee, so he's handicapped uh, from, from a long time, from his childhood. And so, you know, you have somebody, uh, I often joke with him now, because uh, you know, he's up in age, and say, you know, you got one eye, because one of the eyes is blind, you got one leg and one track mind, you're going to need the rest of your body in heaven. That's my dad's joke. Because, you know, that's me and my dad playing around. But, uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's, that's my family. That's what I came in this system with. Uh, I was somewhat dyslexic early age. I saw some things backwards, and I kind of stood up, and I spoke. Uh, and you know, it wasn't if it wasn't for the people that I came to school that I can remember. Uh, my memories in elementary school clearly there are two distinct ones. One was when some kids were trying to mess with me; they were going to jump in the fight or whatever, and, and I needed to find somebody else. And I asked every single teacher in that school, I was attending Riverview, and none of them took it serious enough to, to at least have a conversation or sit down and ask me what I wanted to. Let the other party know that they knew what they were threatening. That's one memory from elementary school that really stands out. The other one is of Mr. Prender, uh, my third grade teacher, a white female, who showed me enough love to uh, one day I went to sleep in class and she let me sleep for about an hour and a half because literally I wasn't, uh, you know, we have a uh, family that's poor and the mom can't sleep too well. Dad is a, you know, is an ex comic There's not much uh, that you have oftentimes. But nonetheless, she gave me some food, she let me sleep, she said, you must be even sick or tired because you even slept through recess. And she showed me love, you know? She showed me love and she spent time with me after I woke up and asked what was going on. Uh, middle school, another white female teacher, uh, Jessica Snyder, who found out that I had glasses and that was the one that I had a crush on actually because she, she cared enough about me to see me who I was, for who I was, and, and draw me close. And, uh, and that was love that I remember from middle school. Um, high school, Steven Sell, who was an engineer, quit being an engineer to help people. He said, I got tired of exploring and I make good money, but I wanted to help young people, so I'm here teaching math. Uh, he said, if you're smart enough to become an engineer, you should try it, and you should do it. And he was the inspiration for me studying actuarial science, but because of who he was, I wanted to become a teacher, and I quit my actuarial job opportunity at Hewitt Associates in 19, uh, in Chicago to say, I'm gonna go back to where he taught me and be as influenced like he was for people that look like me. That's someone that inspired me. He's still teaching now. He rode his bike to school every day to be exercising and fit, and uh, this is someone who let me have a role of leadership in school. Let me break this down. Okay, so people don't know about urban education uh, and what you do and how it's so important for those that succeed because we're succeeding. We have the best achievement. We have higher graduation rates than other schools of our composition, and we want to be accredited with distinction. That means the best despite our uh, population and composition. But the bottom line is people forget about the service we give because they're focused on these things that are tests and so forth that just gave us great deserving accolades for. But if a person like me that can be born to that type of family with being, having those special needs, being dyslexic, speaking, and so forth, and be where I'm standing today, I'm living proof of the type of excellence that each of your children and each of the impacts that you make on a daily basis can give to the ones that come to your room that have similar circumstances, if not worse, and most times better. I'm living proof. 
I'm living proof to those kids, for those kids that really have sometimes suicidal thoughts because they just happen to have channel on channel 11 at 7 o'clock and they hear MASH coming on and that da -da 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 -da. and then they learn as an adult that the title of that song is Suicide is Painless, but as a kid they're thinking about, boy, I hate this because my parents aren't around. You give them hope to come back another day, to put that foolishness out of their mind, to do something with their life, to not be a thug, but to be a scholar, to be a theologian, to be a, someone who's making a difference every day in the community. You do that. You do that every day. And let me share with you, that's more important than any AYP. That's more important than any test. That's more important than any federal state or guideline. But breaking it down using language that I use with parents, here's the deal, you know? As an 11 year old, I was asked to hold some drugs, you know, uh, on, my, on my block. You got gangs, you got gang violence. And here's what happens you get a little bit of money because you're doing something useful. You get a little bit of pride because you got a position on the street, so they respect you. Oh, you got the good stuff, so now I got to go to you, even though you're 11. All right, what's that? You my boss now? Soon, and that's joking, but at the same time, you're going to grow up and be like me. You're going to be an OG. You're going to do this for real. And you're going to make a lot more money than just $50, and people are going to respect you even more. So, but then those three things were simply this. And you know, man, I'm doing this with you because, you know, you're my, you my home guy. Okay, I'm going to take care of you. You're my best for you. Let me know. If a gang can provide more love to you, if a gang can provide some means to being respected, and have some respect and authority or position. You know, I'm proud about myself because I got this role. And if a gang can provide more means to make money, then heck, I will become an administrator of a gang. Because if it's about love and the love is sincere, the criminal activity within that gang, I would say, hey, don't kill them. You know, don't kill them. But love, respect, and access to making money, the fact is that gangs do that better than schools do it. That's the dropout rate reason. If I can't make a means of, of being respected, having love from someone, and making some means, means of money through the above the board practices, there are places that I just happen to be born in that has already pegged me to say, I got that for you right here, you just come on over here. And when that becomes more real to my life and my existence, because you know, I love paying rent when the rent is due, I hope a diamond check is sent to you, talking about mama, you know, you were always there when you were. When I was alone, never left alone, you prepare bills for me. That kind of stuff is real. It's feeding the advice those hierarchy needs. We're talking education needs. It's food, shelter, love, and belonging. If any time we don't bring it that real, then the nature of human beings is to get it somewhere else. And so that is the dilemma that we're seeing in all our large states. Particularly also the dilemma that we're seeing in places that were just as loved and respected with a long legacy, like Wellston, who no longer exists, like the city who's been taken over, like Riverview, who was shut down and taken over. So that their service was not meeting the realness of the needs of the community enough to continue to be the way it was, according to the regulations. Now, we provide equity because we do, and we will because of who we are. But it does require an extra effort of knowing who we serve, who are your kids, who are the family, where are they going, what do they need to get there, those three things. As a teacher, at, even in Rockwood, youngest teacher in the state of Missouri, 19 years old. Now again, dad was a custodian. That's why I love the custodian, because I know what he did, and he had the pleasure of being a custodian. Because you know, we don't just, we don't allow custodians to work in our district if they have a criminal record. So he got a break. Someone gave him something because you have to have standards. And our, we are excellent. We are professional. But he got lucky. He was a custodian. My mom, before she was blind, she was a support staff, a secretary for the government. My brother started as a bus driver for the airport, and then became a park attendant, and then management in the airport, and then switched to become a teacher, taught at Riverview, then became an assistant principal, and then died at 39 died in 39 in leukemia. So these are the people in my mind. On my mom's side, two generations of ministers, her dad and then her. I mean, and so that's the ministry side of giving. If you put 
all those combinations together, that's what makes the soul that I try to bring when I say we're souls first and staff second or students second or staff or stakeholders second. We're souls first. Each of you have a story of legacy like that. But that makes the moral imperative that Ken spoke of that when I speak to people, we talk about moral imperatives. Education is missing the moral imperative right now, nationwide, even district-wide. So I'm going to give you one. Our moral imperative, or our moral purpose, is to educate like our life, our legacy, and our liberty depended on it. Because really, it does. That's the moral imperative. Our moral imperative is to do what we do, be you a teacher or anything else in this room, principal, anything else, support staff of any nature, is to do it with such excellence that we are educating as of our life, our legacy, and our liberty depend on it. Because it really does. Our liberty depends on it because the new Jim Crow that our kindergartners were talking about the old Jim Crow that King destroyed, the new one is incarceration. And if there's so many people that look like me in the age range of 15 to 40, 33% of people that look like me, black male that is, 33% are incarcerated or on probation, which means they cannot vote like the kindergartners vote, they cannot have a job if any one of the jobs that you have here, so they can't make a means of own money, they cannot get a loan for their house, no roof over their head. Let's just stop with those three, because those other cannot. Now, where are you going to turn? Where is the realness for the love, the respect, and the means to make money? It's not up in here, because we don't do that up here. You, you, you come to HR and you pass some of that, and you turn around and walk out. So what we do is for liberty. It's so serious to the point that governors are saying, well, let's let you know, Congress vote. You know, and, and it's not just the black thing. I was just talking about my reference. There are more white people in jail than there are black people, so it's a liberty thing. Because they can't get those things as well. And so then you have governors saying, let's allow people who are incarcerated to vote. And so people are like, oh, that's crazy. And so we're like, okay, I understand the need why. Well, because as a system, we've made imprisonment a means of making money, capitalist, a capitalist venture. Now, within my life, I just give you about six, five systems for those of you uh, that want to know systems. Because I churn systems because as a teacher, I give every child in your classroom systems. Kindergarten, you're learning one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You're counting up in zero, counting numbers. So what's the system? Well, if you use a phone number, the area code tells you what region, what state. It's 314 is here, it's 636 is there, it's 679 is there. And if you're a kindergarten, you need to know that system so that you can get to your house, get to the phone number of your house. Every digit has meaning. 868 for this area, North County, 869, 838, 5, or 458 is for West County. And you can go down the list. Those first three digits of those county numbers have a system, and the system is used for some purpose in life. And that's just my kindergarten lesson. At high school, we were going out taking pictures of the houses and then taking pictures of their houses in Turnberry versus the city. You know, there's a range of $20,000 house to $2 million house. And then we would talk about less than, greater than, and equal to. And in Rockwood, they thought my kids were throwing up game signs. Less than, greater than, you know? You know? But it's like, but those kids outperform the algebra two kids because the way we taught it was about systems. Why is it that you have to own a half an acre house in order to build a house in Turnberry? And how much does that cost? And does the acreage of half an acre cost more than your house? Yes, in most cases it did, because that's fifty thousand to eighty thousand dollars, and that's a system. It's the system of inequalities. What was the origin of that? A book called The Origin of Inequality by Emily Rousseau, seventeen hundreds. My pre-algebra remedial class studied that first, and then they did some little equations that x is less than two. Two had relevance, meaning, purpose behind the systems. That's on the high school level. So, back to relationships and systems. That's for those content oriented people. You make sure you represent systems behind the content you teach. The book is not your curriculum. Life and the world and the students in the world. Bring the whole world to it. Take them to the world. Let them see it. Let them know it. If they do that, the test will be aced. It doesn't matter. It's by relationships. 
You know, Holman is a great example of that in many other places in this room. You take the world to them, you bring the world to them, you take them to the world, you love them, you get them together every day, you meet regularly, you do gatherings. Mark Twain's a sport, gatherings every day, and you have great things happen for kids that may be disadvantaged. The point is, within my life, so I have the system of racism because I'm African American male, which is the minority group, because the majority group is white in this country. I have a system of ableism. My dad was disabled, I was born premature, I was disabled at a point in time, so it's able versus disabled. That's an oppressed group. It's systems are pushing you down if you're in the minority group of ableism. We have also classism. I was I came from this poor, at, at times I was on food stamps. Um, and you know, that's, that's classism. Education, research this, if you're in the lower class, you come in doing 5,000 words, middle class 20,000, upper class, up to 100,000 words in kindergarten. Therefore, you're ready to fly when you walk in versus walk or crawl. Um, and so that's a system, classism. Then there's ageism. Yeah, I'm 33, you know, youngest superintendent in the area, he's the youngest teacher, I'm not afraid of it. There's people that don't like that. You know what, I'm gonna love them anyway. We're gonna do what we have to do anyway. And the bottom line is we're gonna do what we have to do the system says that if you are younger than 30, if you're older than 60, then we hate on you. You know, we don't give you what you need. We don't give you access. That's the system of ableism. There are some other systems. Religious oppression, sexual uh, discrimination, gender. So, you know, females. I am not a female, so I'm not in that category. But every female in here, you know there are glass ceilings that you can't go above, you can't go beyond, because it just doesn't, society doesn't allow you to get there. And that's not right. We want to be the change to that so that occurs. You get past it. Sexual orientation. We serve students that have different sexual persuasions than what we may have. Those are systems. So I applied myself, my life applies to six. I've been to nine in here. Here's the thing. As a school district, I want to just put this together. We have a model of each child as our own. And that's how we as adults are to act with children. Treating them with the love, the respect, and the need to earn money as if they were our own child. That's number one. What's our model as it pertains to staff to staff in light of all those systems working to make you not be, to be less than, not value? It is the golden rule. Treat each other as you wish to be treated. That's that rule. That's our model. Our golden rule. One of the people who was the teacher of the year said, we have to, no, it was actually Marjorie Mills who said it. He said, we model that excellence and character first. We have to love one another first, lift one another up because we have people pulling us down, systems pulling us down. It's the system more than the people, and we have to fight the system by who we are, and there are also people that fight the system just head on speaking truth to power and transparency to dishonesty. But nonetheless, those are systems. We have to represent it. So number one, each child with our own, that's a student, staff to student. Staff to staff is literally the golden rule. As a staff to the school district and parents to the school district, bottom line is we have to begin, we have to continue to give access, have excellence and equity to things that maybe, let's say, my CBS will give. Some stuff that I talk about with planes, urban gardening over the summer where we pay money to have students do some urban stuff, which was originally set for 30 private school kids in this community. Bump them out of the way and say, no, we're giving it to 20 of our students. That keeps our kids here. And then parents on the break come to me and say, you know, that's risky, Dr. Boy. How are you going to do that? Why are you going to allocate the money? Were you, you, weren't you afraid? No, I'm not afraid because we don't stay as real as their needs are that they will leave. They being blacks, they being whites, they being, being anybody who has the means to get out of here. That's what's happened in two places like Boston, the city, and Riverview. And then laws come on top and say, no, you must take them like Clayton versus Turner, because it's just to take them. But the bottom line is, now, our creed as a system, we have to institutionalize excellence every day through providing this equity in a way that defines excellence and redefines it over and over and over to meet every child's need. That will be a quote that you see in what's coming out on our smaller CSIP plan, not 30 pages, but six, four pages, and then two that I wrote, this philosophy, this vision, this model, this imperative. Four pages. Succinct because we got to be smarter and more narrow, and more precise, and more personal, and more
and more of a learning community, professional learning community. But the bottom line is systems of excellence. We define what we need, we redefine what we do to meet new needs if we are all on a card. Let me talk about real quickly what that means. You know, the bottom line is this community needs to be waking up. If we're talking about Avis, I did this with the new teachers. Let me do two things. One is more personal, wake you up. I'm gonna count to three and I'm just gonna clap by myself. One, two, three. Now, way back there, I don't think they heard that. I'm gonna count to three. I just want this, these two rows to clap and say three. One, two, three. Way back there, did you hear us? I'm gonna count to three, and I want right now, I want everybody on this side of the room that first out to clap on the count of three. One, two, three. A little bit better. For the sake of effect, on the count of three, everybody in this room clap after three. And I say one, two, three. One, two, three. Now we got some synergy. I didn't hear it echo until we got to all of us. That means we couldn't define the we couldn't defy the laws of physics enough to create a force in this room with air and our hands that had it happen twice until we literally got all of us. There was a lot over here, but it had no impact in the atmosphere. Parents are lost. Students are wandering around lost. Sometimes even staff are lost in, within their life situations. And within the atmosphere that they walk into, it either makes the lostness greater or the sense of loss less. It lessens the sense of loss. If we're educated as a fire of life, our legacy and our living depend on it. When they find us, they will not be lost. They will at least have a place for rest if they're on survival mode. They will at least have a place for hope if they're in a despair mode and they will have a place to get them to their future if they're willing to do some hard work. Because the, what you created in the physical atmosphere, some people don't like to get spiritual, some people don't like to get, they say, ooh, but there was an echo in here. And that's not ghostly, that's just physics. It's about climbing. If it's the little eyes and the big U's and the big U's or you know, the, the big U's of Super 10 on the boss, people with leadership, power, and ability, and we're not helping anybody, then I failed. I give you the same vow that I gave you before in other schools when I came up here in my other role. I will resign the second I'm in the way for excellence. I have enough sense to get out of your way and allow me to have a better leader, someone who's more seriously committed to come in and do it. Because frankly, there's no time to waste. Liberty is too important. Your life, our retirement, you need somebody to take care of us, but the looks of some of our kids sometimes, we get a little scared. I do <laughs> that's, that's just real. Scared going home sometimes. But we got to make a difference in that. We need a whole community. You'll see more community projects, community efforts. We have a whole department of community engagement. We have town hall meetings, too. We have hopper meetings like before. We have a back to school kickoff for the whole community on the 10th from 4 30 to 6 30. At Parker Road's backfield, right by the administration office, with the, with police departments, fire departments, libraries, vendors for the community, they are coming out to support. It was ran sponsored by the parent liaisons in every building. There are paid parent liaisons, parents who are paid to do things for parents to help support teachers in the school, principals in the school. We will have a superintendent parent advisory committee with PTO vice president and president as well as parent community members coming on a quarterly basis to meet with me to keep them moving in one direction. I have been actually advisory committees for multiple levels, parents, community advisory committee, student advisory committee. Ferguson has a student advisory advisory committee that goes to the mayor, goes to city council meeting, and they also speak with me. We guide them and then they partner so we can make great things happen. Right here, right now. Those are the outside efforts that happen. You will hear a lot more about that coming, but I just want you to know that you can do this. You can do this. I want you to hear that we heard our staff band, we heard our kindergartners, we heard Alexis sing to us beautiful. I mean, she's a recording artist making it and maybe even further as she gets older. I want you to hear some work from a CD that 
Berkeley Middle School students made a song called I Can Do It. Some of you, when you hear it, it's gonna sound like you know some of that junk that you may hear booming in people's cars that's just junk filled. But if you listen to the words and actually the beat, it's done with class. It is Ricardo. It's better than the stuff that's out there. Accept it. Listen to the words carefully because it says everything that children are capable of, but also what you're capable of about urban middle school. Go for it. Back where I'm from, it ain't all peaches and cream Where I am now, it feels like a dream People kicked me when I was down But I brushed the dirt from my shoulders and came back round I can uh. do it, I can overachieve I can accomplish my dreams I can do it, I can reach my goals I can hold down my own I can do it, this is my time Now come and watch me shine Stop to so make it. Do it. Uh, here's a question in the form of a statement. Uh, would you 
point up. Everybody, I think, can do that here. So, point up. About 80% is pointing up. Some people don't participate. That happens, and they can do that. Except when it's in your classroom, all right? <laughs> all right, now you can point down. Now, everyone, point north. All right, now you can put your hand down. All right, all right. So, some people are doing this. First, some people are doing this, 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 this. And the people that had it right are the people doing this. Now, what makes the difference? You know, sometimes, I'm just going to let them know, it's pretty simple. Everybody needs an anchor. You need an anchor. And that anchor is your point of reference. And that point of reference, as you know, if that highway back there goes this way, and north is that way. President, that was your point of anchor. It's a highway. Beautiful, beautiful. Other people have other anchors. Like, you know, I happen to have an iPhone right here, so <laughs> maybe I need to take out. Thank you, technology. <laughs> Some people use the other people that they trust in. They say, oh, they point that way, so I'm going to point that way, too. That's your anchor. Birds of a feather flock together. Eagles don't fly with pigeons. Better make sure you wish some eagles if you're one of those people. I ain't no pigeon. I don't go crap no stuff. You just love very beautiful in your car, no. I am an eagle. Eagles fly high. They stay up greater than anybody. Birds of the feather flock together. Eagles don't fly with pigeons. Eagles don't even fly with eagles. They soar alone. Five miles above the limits, they can all do it, but they know that they're leaders, so they do it in their direction. You don't see them migrate in one path together. I am not the type of person that is going to allow any one of us to have pigeons. Pooping on stuff. Even kids, when they rock their head like a pigeon, I say, is there a picture? I can do it. Not to you, I can do you, but no, I can do it. I can reach my goals. Because they're not peacocks, they're not pigeons. Peacocks look pretty, they got feathers, they come with the greatest cold shoes, and no, they don't free reduce much. They don't have nothing in their mind. Peacocks. Thank you all. Have a great day.